Well, good morning again, Thursday Church. Okay. All right. Let's, let's engage, okay? Let's have a, well, I'll get to that. All right. Here's what I would like for us to do this morning. I want to start off with a math question because there's nothing like starting your Sunday morning off with a good mathematics equation. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, boy. Okay. Well, I, I feel the excitement. I, I feel it rising right now. Actually, I feel the tension. Okay. So anyway, whether you guys want to do it or not, here is the math problem. Ready? God plus you plus one equals? Eternity. Heaven. Ooh. Um, uh, okay. All right. God plus you plus one equals? Majority. And these are good answers. These were not ones I was expecting. Good quality answers. How about this? God plus you plus one, or God plus me plus one equals the church. That's what. So there were a lot of answers to this math problem, which I wasn't anticipating, but that's okay. All right. So God plus you plus one equals the church. Jesus, Jesus said so. He said, where two or three gather together in my name, I am there among them. We meet quorum. This is good. We meet quorum today. All right, so if you, or if God plus you plus one equals a church, and obviously God, being the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are the most important parts of this equation, but for the church to exist, it takes you plus one or me plus one, obviously, right? Now, if you plus one are, vital, are vitally important to the life of the church, that means one of the most important aspects in the church is that, is that part of the equation too. The U plus one. Our friendships. Our, our connections. Our relationships. And so this morning I want to talk about powerful relationships. And uh, so anyway, that's where we're going. Now I said we're going to talk about this. And, and this, is, this is your opportunity right here. This is, this is the part where we are going to engage in a conversation, so to speak. I am curious, what qualities make for powerful friendships? What is it in your mind that makes a person a good friend? And again, this is your turn. This will be your one and only opportunity right here to have the conversation. From here on out, I'm going to be pretty selfish. I hope you don't mind. Um, but, but right now, here's what I'd like. And if you, you just have one, what? just raise your hand, and I'll just kind of pick around the room. Tanner. Loyalty is one. Julie. Trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. Yes. Compassion and understanding. Compassion and understanding. He stole yours. <laughs> Man, trust, trustworthiness. Yes. Acceptance, a friend that accepts you. Okay, yes. What? Love. Love, good stuff. And Brian dittos that. Okay. What's that? Loving your neighbor, absolutely. Okay, so those are great qualities. Faithfulness is another great quality. All right, you guys, you guys have a pretty good understanding of what it looks like for good friendships, right? And I hope it's not just a head knowledge. I hope it's something that you're pouring out in your life because our friendships are vitally important. In fact, our friendships, our relationships that we have with others are eternally significant. Let's put some weight to this thing, Right? How we treat others has eternal significance. We can either draw people into the kingdom or we can push them away. And then there's stuff in between too. But they have eternal significance. Okay. Now when I was trying to think of a, of a biblical example of what would, what would a powerful friendship look like, I got to tell you, my mind went instantly back to my childhood. I spent most of my life, I grew up in the church, had a time of, of being separated out of the church, and then went back when I was about 16. Okay, but as a kid going to church, my mind went right back to Sunday school. And I thought of those guys that, that brought their paralytic friend, right, to Jesus in order to find healing. That was the first thing that came to my mind. And that right there seemed to be a great example of a powerful friendship, one that is so powerful, one that is so noteworthy that it's found in three out of four Gospels. It is one of the most popular um, biblical accounts that it gets shared with kids' ministry on any given Sunday or Thursday or whenever uh, you meet for worship, right? It's right up there with David versus Goliath. I mean, this thing gets talked about quite often. All right, so I went on a little Google search um, for uh, a picture, right? 
I, I felt like um, the thing, because we usually do seat reminders, I thought this might be a little extensive. I thought maybe we should probably have put out a packet of crayons and, uh, and like coloring pages, and we would sit here, because it's so ingrained to me that we need to do something like this. Okay, so anyway, I did a little Google search, and this is the coloring page I came up with. Um, now, here's the thing. I love this picture um, because it is an absolute mess. Uh, there's some things that are going on here that I think are pretty funny. Okay, so anyway, um, you guys see anything wrong with this picture? All right, let me just start off lighthearted. Um, I didn't know this before, but um, did you know Jesus had, am had amazingly large hands, bigger than anybody else? Um, that was one of the things that kind of pointed out to me, uh, that Jesus had large hands. Okay, all right, so anyway, um, now if you notice up on the roof, uh, there are some friends up there, right? A lot of times they put how many friends on the roof to lower somebody down, one in each corner. Typically there's four, okay, no problem. Do you guys see another problem with anything on the roof? How many heads do you see on the roof? Yeah, three friends, two heads. I'm not sure what this coloring page is teaching kids. Um, maybe, if, you know, if you help your friends, you could lose your head. <laughs> right? Uh, it, is, it is absolutely twisted. Okay, so anyway, um, I, love this, I love this picture. Um, it just makes me laugh. Okay, so as I said, typically on a on a on a, any coloring page, what you will see are four guys, they help their friends. Now, truth is, in the Bible, we really don't know how many friends. It just says some friends brought their, their paralytic friend before Jesus. It could have been three, it could have been four, more or less. We just don't know that. However, um, what I do know is that this man who was unable to help himself had some really good friends. Friends that were, were willing to uh, carry him on a mat to a house where they had heard that Jesus was doing some, some teaching. Now, when these friends saw that the house was overflowing with people, I love their perseverance. They didn't just give up, did they? They kept pushing forward. Now, in my mind, I think that one of the however many, four, let's just say, one of the four had to be the bad idea friend. Do you guys know what bad idea friends are? Okay, bad idea friends are those friends in your life. They always had ideas, but those ideas always led to trouble. That is your bad idea friend, right? My cousin was my bad idea friend. Okay, so anyway, um, it had to be the bad idea friend who finally used his superpowers of bad ideas for good on this one. And so he comes up with this really crazy and harebrained scheme. If you think about it, he says, you know what? There's a set of stairs, they're narrow, but we can go up on the roof. All right, we're in. We can do this. We can go up on the roof. And then we're going to start digging through the roof. And that's when the other friend should have went, eh, I don't know about this, right? And then we're going to take some ropes right here, and we're going to lower our paralytic friend down through the roof and get him before Jesus. And no one said, wait, hold a tick. They said, let's do this. And they went up on the roof, and they started digging. Now, there's another person in my mind, okay? Now, these are just in, in my strange imagination when I read this, this, this account of what happened. I think of people who were there, but you don't get to hear about them. I think of poor Mr. Homeowner. Because this isn't bad, Mr. Bad Idea Friend's house. This is some other person's house, right? And he is, he is sitting there. He is enjoying the presence of Jesus. He is listening to, this, to Jesus do some powerful teaching. I mean, this is awesome. He is, it's a packed house, literally, and it is just, it's amazing. So he's, he's sitting there, and all of a sudden he hears some scurrying up on the roof. And he's thinking to himself, what, what is that? And all of a sudden, you know, stuff starts flaking down, and next thing you know, he has skylight, right? And I can't imagine being Mr. Homeowner. I, I got to tell you what would happen if I were Mr. Homeowner. I'd be like, who is going to fix this mess? Because it sure is not going to be me. I didn't create the whole Jesus. Who are you going to get up there to fix this problem? 
I didn't create this. What is going on here, right? And I think if it were me, and I know myself, I think I would have been so focused on this inconvenience of a hole in a roof that I would totally have missed the miraculous. That I think I would have been so focused on the wrong thing rather than keeping my eyes on Jesus and what he's doing. I, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be transparent. What's going on here? Oh, dude just walked. There's a hole in my roof. And how often we miss out on what Jesus is doing when we focus on the wrong thing, when we focus on the inconvenience in life. And rather than just ride the wave and see what Jesus wants from us, we focus on the inconvenience, right? All right. I hope Mr. Homeowner didn't miss out on the power of what took place because of a small, unplanned inconvenience. And I hope you never miss out on what Jesus has for you and what's going on in your life because of a small, unplanned inconvenience. Now, this morning, uh, I want to get out of, I I don't want to just tell it from my imagination, right? And so I'd like for us to look at the actual biblical account of what takes place. So if you would, grab a Bible, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 17. We're going to go through 26. And it's found on page 855 if you're using one of our Bibles. Again, Luke chapter 5, we'll start with verse 17, page 855. Now, what we're going to read about in Luke 5 is it really, this, this takes place really early on in Jesus' ministry, almost at the very beginning, almost at the get-go. And yet, Jesus has done a lot of amazing stuff even up to this point. I mean, he, is, he has already been hard at work healing other people. He has cast out, excuse me. He has cast out demons. He has called some of his closest companions to come follow him. And along the way, he has also done some really powerful teaching about the good news about the kingdom of heaven, right? That salvation is near. And so Jesus' hard work, he's doing a lot of stuff. And to say the least, because of all the truly amazing activity he's already done, Jesus is gaining a great deal of popularity and notoriety among the people. And so people are starting to follow him wherever he goes, and word is spreading about the power of God that is flowing through him. However, it is also here where Jesus is going to begin his battle. And catch this. This is where the battle begins between the Pharisees and the, and the religious leaders of the day. This is where it all starts in Luke. And let's read together Luke 5, starting with verse 17. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of the religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. You see, Jesus was getting popular, is what 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 the writer was saying there. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up on the roof, and they took off some tiles. And then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Excuse me. Now, don't close your Bible just yet. So here we have these guys, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to help their friend. I'd have to say we could all agree those are some powerful friendships right there, right? Doing whatever it takes to get you where you need to be. To me, a a sign of a good friend is one that will do anything in their power to help you, especially when it comes to getting you to the healing power of Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you, my best friend Dave isn't just my best friend because we grew up since I... I, There's a picture of him holding me as a baby. He He will always be my best friend because he is the one who brought me back to church. He's the one who helped lead me back to Christ in the time where life was pretty painful and I could have taken a whole lot of wrong turns, but he came at just the right moment to help me. And you know what's funny? I got the opportunity to do the exact same thing for him. There was a time when he was contemplating suicide and one night we were standing there, uh, we were at youth group and he wasn't there that night and I went to my youth leader and I said, hey Jeff, I don't know what it is, but God's really placed something on my heart that we need to stop right now and pray. And a few months later, we were at winter retreat, and you know what? He just broke down sobbing, and and he started to have this moment of of a testimony, right? He said, you know what? Three months ago on a Sunday night, I was at the edge of a cliff, and I wanted to drive my car off it, and I just felt God's presence telling me, don't do it. Powerful friendships. Came full circle for us. 
Powerful friendships have eternal significance. And in Luke 5, we find this guy who's in need of some serious help. I mean, he can't get to Jesus on his own strength. He is completely, utterly dependent upon someone else to get him to him. And so without his friends, he isn't going to find the healing he needs from Jesus. You know, the same could be said today. There are people all around us in painfully debilitating situations, and they need to, he- they need to find the pow- a, a powerful friendship that will get them to Jesus in order so that they can find healing from all kinds of pain and suffering that they're experiencing in life. But who's going to carry them to Who's going to carry them to Jesus? Who's going to get your neighbor to Jesus? Who is going to get your friends, your coworkers, your family members to Christ for that healing? Who's going to be the one to carry him there? That's our job. We need to do that. We need to learn to have compassion. We need to ask God for compassion for others. And we need to carry those people to the cross of Christ in order to find healing. All right. So in Luke, 5, in Luke 5, what the friends all assumed was that when they were carrying their friend to Jesus, that he would just be bringing about physical healing. What they never assumed in all, I mean, they, they, they could not even begin to see this, was that Jesus would not just offer physical healing, but that he was going to offer healing for this man's soul right in front of everybody. Jesus was going to bring forgiveness of sin that that, that, that man had committed. You see, the way we treat others, just as I've been telling you, will have an eternal impact. How we treat people is very, very significant. All right, so let's pick up up where we left off on verse 20. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. Who would not want to hear Jesus say those words? Young man, young woman. Man, woman, child, your sins are forgiven. Powerful words. But the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law, they said to themselves, who does he think he is? That is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? And just so, uh, I I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And so Jesus turned to the paralyzed man. He said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, catch this, because you know what? This is a guy who never walked before, and look what he's about to do. Immediately he got up. In fact, it doesn't say he kind of rolled over on the side and gently got up. It tells us he jumped up. He got up immediately, and he jumped to his feet He picked up his mat, and he went home. But he didn't just go home. He went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with such wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have have seen amazing things. Now let me tell you, the amazing things that they saw in that moment are not just a paralytic man who had never walked jumping up to his feet. The amazing thing is something that Jesus said, and it's something that I pointed out earlier. It's that, young man, your sins are forgiven. That also is an amazing thing that they're sitting there going, oh my goodness, what just happened? You know, for the longest time, I couldn't figure out why Jesus would ask him that question. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? Because in my 21st century thinking, I'm thinking to myself, oh man, your sins are forgiven, right? I mean, I, I, I'm pastor. Jesus can forgive your sins. I tell people that on a regular basis. It seems mu- so much easier to say, your sins are forgiven. And I got te- to be completely transparent and honest. I do not have the faith. I do not have the faith that when someone comes to me and if they, if they couldn't walk to say, you know what, stand up, pack up your chair and go home. To me, that seems like the much harder thing to say. Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. But that's not what Jesus said at all. Jesus said, no, 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 that, that's, that's the harder part. No, your sins are forgiven is the harder part. You know, I can, I can tell someone simply, your sins are forgiven. 
Simply because the Bible promises if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. That's a promise within the Bible. So as I said, my 21st century thinking says that's the easier thing to say. But here's the deal. In Jesus' day, the easier thing for him to say was actually stand up and walk. The far more difficult and the far more dangerous thing for him to ever say was your sins are forgiven. Because as, they, as Scripture pointed out, that is blasphemy. That is a crime punishable by death. It is a crime that is going to begin Jesus' journey to the cross. This is where, the, I told you when we start. this is where the battle begins. This is where the Pharisees are going to say, all right, enough is enough. The healing stuff, that's awesome. The teaching stuff, that's awesome. This is where we draw the line. He cannot say your sins are forgiven. Only God can do that. And what Jesus was doing in that moment is he was equating himself with the Heavenly Father. When Jesus said your sins are forgiven... In that moment, he declared that he is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. This is the moment where Jesus says to those around him, listen, I am more than just some, some prophet. I am more than just some good moral teacher. I am more than just a, this amazing faith healer. In that moment, Jesus says, I am. I am. I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. I am the one who came to set the captives free. I am one with the Father. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law in that moment, and everyone else sitting there for, for that matter, is sitting there and it was probably jaw-dropping. Because what Jesus had said in that one little sentence that we think is so powerful, and it is powerful, but in that one Short sentence. Jesus said the absolute unthinkable. Your sins are forgiven. And it is with those words, your sins are forgiven, is where Jesus confronts not only those who heard him that day, but confront, confronts us as well with one question. Who do, you, who do I believe Jesus to be? Who do I believe Jesus is? Who do I believe Jesus to be? You see, when it comes to Jesus, we're really confronted with one of three options. And the three options aren't what most of the people in our society think they are. One of three options isn't good teachers, not prophet. It isn't, um, oh, what's the third one? Uh, good person, so on and so forth. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote. He said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something far worse. You can shut him up for being a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or... You can fall on your face at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that up to us, and he did not intend to. In other words, what C.S. Lewis said is we must come to the conclusion that either Jesus was a liar or a lunatic, or he's the Lord of all. There is nothing in between. The first two, liar and lunatic, are the conclusion that the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law came to. However, on that day, the third option was one that many others had come to, which was, wow, what just happened before us here? What just happened? Can you, can you believe it? Jesus just equated himself with God. There is, uh, what, uh, what's going on? And not only that, he backed it up by that, that dude just stood up and he, he got up and he walked away. We cannot deny what just happened here. We just watched a man have complete transformation physically and spiritually. And this man, Jesus, must be who he says he is. 
He must be one with God the Father. He must be God in the flesh. He must be the one who came to restore sight to the blind. He must be the one who came to make the the lame walk again. The one who came to set the captives free from sin and death. And they knew that scripture because that's Old Testament stuff. And so this must be the one. The one who has the power to forgive our sins. The one who has the power to make us right, to set us apart and restore us completely. That is, if we confess our sins to him. That's where it starts. If we confess our sins to him, then and only then is he, fa- he will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our wicked deeds. You know, the most powerful friendship we can have I had, it, I had the titles in plural, but really it should have been in the singular. The title of the whole thing was Powerful Friendships. But the most powerful friendship that we can possibly have isn't with our neighbor or our spouse. It's not with our coworker. It's not with our family members. The most powerful relationship that we can possibly ever have is with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's it. In John 15, 14, Jesus said this, you are my friends, and here's a big word, if. Those two little letters there carry a whole lot of weight in this sentence. You are my friends if you do what I command. If you do what I command. So on that note, I ask you some questions. Are you following the commandments of Christ? Are you experiencing the friendship of the one who can forgive your sins? Last question. Will today be the day you turn to Jesus? Will today be the day you you cleanse yourself and confess your sin and ask for forgiveness and go and sin no more and begin to follow his commands? Will today be that day? If you're able to stand in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would guide us to be people who are completely and wholly surrendered to your will. Lord, help us to live a life in such a way that it points others back to you and give us grace if we fail. Lord, help us to be obedient to your word. Today, oh Lord, would you draw us into a deepening relationship of love for you so that we may love others like you love us. And Lord, For those who are here today who have not yet decided to follow your son, would you please draw them into your forgiveness and salvation in this moment? Will you lead them into the arms of your love and grace? Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I give you praise for the fact that you sent your son for us, for the fact that you gave him so that one day we can hear the words, young man, young woman, your sins are forgiven. Lord, thank you for forgiving me of my sins. They are, weight, they, are weight, they are weighty and many. Lord, I thank you for, the, for this fact that you love us that much to forgive each and every single person in this room if we confess our sins to you. Lord, I just pray that you would just continue to, to change us, continue to change the way we think, continue to mold how we act towards people, continue to, to, to just... Do all the work on the inside, Lord. Cleanse us out. Just remove all the junk, Lord, and just completely uh, do a renovation on the inside so that it, our, your love will just flow out of us. Lord, I thank you and I give you praise. And I just ask these things in Jesus' name.